Hey guys, do you enjoy painting wet and wet? I've had many people tell me they don't enjoy the wet and wet painting process because they get paper buckle, they can't control the pigment, and the outcome is unpredictable. And these are all true. So today I'm going to be explaining how to paint effectively wet and wet and how you can have more control during that painting process. So I think I first need to explain what painting wet in wet is. Wet in wet is when you have a wet paintbrush, it's loaded with pigment, and you're dropping this pigment load into a sheen of water that's already on your paper. And that sheen of water grabs your pigment, throws it everywhere, and this is where you can lose control. So I'm gonna be sharing with you several tips on how to keep control during this wet in wet process. Tip number one, I think is a really easy solution. That's use masking. When we use masking, we can be pretty confident that when we take the mask up, we can still have the whites of the paper. We just have to plan ahead. So I'm evaluating my picture and I realize the parrots really need to be masked, especially the upper bodies. So I will be masking those and I'm also going to be masking those two large leafy areas that I want to be in the foreground at the end of the painting. By masking these two areas, I'm preserving the whites of the paper and then I can paint them with bright colors at the very end. Point number two is to use a wide brush, and this one I use all the time. If you are making a sheen of water on your paper, and you're trying to do that with a small brush, you're not going to have an even sheen. You'll probably have some areas that have a puddle, and other areas that will be dry. And to just solve this solution, just use a wide brush. Just put down two or three quick layers of water on that paper using that wide brush, then when you drop in your pigments, you can pretty well be assured that you will have even distribution across the paper. And then point number three is paint in layers. Now the Italians have a wet and wet style and it is called alla prima, which basically means at first attempt. With this form of wet and wet painting, the whole idea is during the entire painting, you're just gonna be painting with different levels of water on the paper. Sometimes it'll be very wet, sometimes it'll be moist, and sometimes it'll be damp, but you never allow the paper to dry. This actually takes a lot of expertise, a lot of skill, you can get a lot of blooms. Solution, just paint in layers. Allow each layer to dry between, and then you can pretty much be assured that you can build up those layers. Now, if you're going to be painting in layers, I would suggest maybe three layers, for example. Your first layer could be wet in wet, and this is when you take your wet paintbrush, you load it up with pigment, and it just explodes the colors around. That's fine. Let it dry. Second time around is going to be a wet on damp. So you look around, there's an area where you want to add more detail, but you want that detail to be a little bit soft. You dampen the paper a little bit. You don't want to get it too wet because that would activate the paint underneath. You dampen the paper, you put down a few strokes of paint, and those strokes will have fuzzy edges, but they will still not travel far. And this is how you build up your layers and your form. Let that dry. And your last layer, potentially, could be wet on dry. And this is the layer where you touch in your pigment and you know your pigment is going to sit exactly where you put it because the paper is dry. This layer is really good for getting the details in the eyes, the branches on the trees, wrinkles on the face. It's a final stage layer. And then tip number four, paint light to dark. Now, if we are acrylic or oil painters, of course we're gonna be painting dark to light because we can put paint on top of paint. But as watercolorists, we have to maintain that light at all times. So we start light and then we go darker. So we start with a light layer, we drop in our darker layers, maybe up in the corners they'll be darker, but we're always considering where the lights are gonna be, where the darks are gonna be, and we try to maintain that brightness somewhere in the painting.
And this brings us to number five, which is to keep our water clean. Because we have so much water on our canvas, it is so easy to get muddy colors. And for this reason, we have to constantly rinse our brush out and bring in fresh water. And to do this, I would recommend two glasses of water. So when you're going to be changing a color that you're moving around on the paper, rinse that brush out completely, dip your brush in a second cup of water that has fresher water, and from that second cup, you're bringing the fresh water back to your canvas. And this brings us to tip number six, which is to understand the amount of water in your brush and that on your canvas. What I mean by this is if you have a very wet brush and you're bringing that to the canvas that is a little bit drier, when the water from your brush pushes against the pigments already in the paper, you're going to get a kind of pushing or we call it a bloom or some people call it a cauliflower. A lot of people don't like blooms and cauliflowers. They try to avoid them. So to avoid them is to bring a drier brush to your canvas and then you shouldn't get them. Now point number seven is textures. One of the beauties about painting wet and wet is we can get all kinds of fascinating textures during this wet and wet process. It might be during the wet process, the moist or the damp, but we can get these kinds of textures. For example, we can get clouds. We can drop in water into the sky and that water is going to push against some of the pigments there in the sky and get a type of cloud. Now I actually got a type of feathering effect on the breast of those parrots and I was using my nail brush. They had a little bit more water than what was on the surface of the paper and I just lightly tapped here and there and that created kind of a feathery cloudy, I don't know, I liked the effect. It was really cool. Another effect was with that damp brush, I was drawing little scoops, and those little scoops made the little round edges of the feather. And I thought that was really cool too. And another way to get the texture, and this is the bokeh effect, is to drop in a drop of water in a very damp area, and the pigments haven't exactly settled yet, and so the water is going to push against the pigments, but they haven't settled, so you're not going to get a bloom. You're just going to get a wider area there. And that's a really cool bokeh effect. And it is this unique characteristic of using water to paint the paper or to change the surface of the paper. This is what makes the magic of watercolor. As opposed to acrylics and oils, we can use water as a tool. And point number eight, this is one of my favorite tips to offer, that is to use a mobile surface. If you are painting and your canvas is always flat, you're not gonna get a lot of movement unless your brush is pushing those colors around. But if you are able to pick up your paper, move the paints around, you're gonna get really interesting areas that can be concentrated and others that can be diluted. You can control the amount of water, the puddles. It's just a great way to paint. How to get this mobile surface is you can use a watercolor block or I have often used an acrylic sheet and I just tape my watercolor paper to that. But this technique is really good for flow and getting those soft and disappearing edges. Okay, so I just gave you eight techniques on how to paint more effectively during the wet in wet process. Let me share with you two actual tips on the products themselves. So the products are the pigments that you use and the paper. So tip number nine is know your paints. Now the reason I say this is that some paints travel. You put them in the water and zing, they just take off running. So some paints are just travelers and others are rather stationary. Some of the travelers could be your phthalo blue, phthalo green, queen red, some of your yellows. They like taking little vacations. While your ochres will just sit there. No matter how much water you put in, the ochres just don't travel much usually. So you would have to help them travel by pushing them with your brush. So if you know your colors and how well they travel or don't, you can better plan how the water is going to paint your picture. 
Another point about knowing your colors is some colors stain and others don't. So your highly staining colors, you can lift them out, but only in that very wet stage. Once those staining pigments start to get into the paper, game over, you're gonna have a stained paper. Now there are other colors that just don't stain that much and you can lift them out when they're wet, when they're dry, doesn't really matter. So some of your staining colors are the phthalo blue and the phthalo green. They are notoriously bad for staining. And the colors that are easily liftable are your cadmiums, your cobalts, and your ochres. These are really nice for lifting out even when they're dry. And our final point, number 10, is to have good paper. Now, I'm a detail painter, and so I need to have a hot press paper. I also like painting with a lot of wet and wet. And for that reason, I need to have a paper that can really take this wet and wet process. And not many papers really do that well. But my favorite two papers are the Arches, of course, and the Fabriano Artistico. These two papers can do pretty good with the punishing amounts of water that I put on them. Of course, they do buckle a little bit. All papers buckle. They are paper. But these papers can take quite a bit. Now, when you are choosing a paper, I know cost is a factor, but there are three other factors that you do need to consider. Number one is your paper should have 140 pound, and that's pretty standard. If you have a 140 pound paper, it's pretty thick and can take quite a bit of water, hopefully. Point number two is really your paper should be cotton as opposed to cellulose. Cellulose is a wood pulp and is just not as absorbent as cotton. And then the third point you need to consider is the amount of sizing. Now, sizing is not mentioned usually on the cover of your package of paper, so you have to do some research. But sizing basically is what keeps the paints on the surface of the paper rather than letting them be absorbed into the paper, which means the paints will stay vibrant. Now, water disturbs the sizing. So if you put a lot of water on some papers, the sizing is gonna be washed off and the pigments will just go into the cellulose and the colors won't be as vibrant. All papers, as far as I know, have a different way of applying that sizing and I don't know much about it. But anyway, those three factors are what you need to consider when you're finding a paper suitable for you. And that is the weight, cotton over cellulose, and the amount of sizing and how good that sizing stays on in the wet and wet process. So guys, I hope these 10 steps really help you in your wet and wet painting process. And guys, I also wanna say thank you for sticking with me to the end. If you would make a comment and put a painter's palette after your comment, I will know that you stuck with me throughout and I'm so happy. Thanks guys and happy painting to you.